Uh, good afternoon, everyone, um, and uh, welcome to our lunchtime seminar to uh, showcase the simple ARD service for Northern Ireland and uh, Scotland. Uh, just to reiterate that this presentation is being recorded, um, and there'll be a section of questions at the end of the uh, uh, seminar, and uh, the recording will go onto the GNCC website, but we'll anonymize the questions. Um, uh, but uh, please be aware that you are being um, are being uh, recorded. Uh, you've all been put on mute for the duration of this, um, and the uh, but you will have access and the ability to ask questions as you go along using the question function that you should see on the right hand side of your um, controls for the webinar. Uh, so do please use that to raise questions about the service as we go along and we'll have a question and answer session at the end. But also if you have uh, technical questions, we'll have um, people watching that to try and uh, give you a bit of advice if there are any technical questions as we go along. Uh, so without further ado, um, my name is uh, Ulrich Wilson and I uh, co-lead the uh, Digital and Data Solutions team at the Joint Nature Conservation Committee, JNCC. So, JNCC is a public body that advises UK government and devolved administrations on uh, UK-wide and international nature conservation. We're an impartial scientific authority and we provide advice on practical policy relevant evidence-based solutions to support decision making. I co-manage the Simple ARD service with my colleague Guao Jones. Um, Guao, would you like to uh, introduce yourself? Hello, everybody. So, yes, I'm Guao Jones, and I'm a senior Earth Observation Specialist at JNCC. And like Ulrich said, I, I co-manage this uh, this service. So, taking through the details of how to access the data today is my colleague uh, Paula Lightfoot. Uh, Paula. Yeah, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Paula Lightfoot. I'm an Earth Observation Specialist at um, JNCC, and I'm helping out providing user support for the Simple ARD service. So you'll also be hearing in a moment from uh, Shona Nicholl from the Scottish Government and Ian Davies from the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, and I'll ask them to introduce themselves when they uh, uh, have their uh, slot in a moment. So the uh, uh, Scottish Government and Northern Ireland Environment Agency fund the simple ARD service so uh, uh, you have them to thank for this uh, uh, this access to data. Um, so today's webinar will give you a bit of background on the service from Shona and Ian. Um, we'll introduce the uh, they'll introduce the service for their respective countries. Um, Gua will introduce the uh, analysis ready data sets. Um, I'll give a bit of a background on technical and operational infrastructure. Uh, you'll have a given a flavour by Guar of the different types of applications and uses of the data, but I hope that will whet your appetite and you'll see many other applications um, for the data that uh, perhaps from your own domain uh, that perhaps we could discuss towards the end. Um, um, Paula will explain how you actually get access to the data and the resources that we're making available to support users in using the service. Uh, and again, just to reiterate that if you've got any questions, please use the um, uh, the questions function um, in GoToWebinar, and we'll have a Q&A section at the end. So I'll um, uh, over to now to um, Shona Nicholl from the Scottish Government. Hello, thanks very much, Ulrich. Um, yeah, hi everyone. Um, I'm Shona Nicholl and I uh, work within the Chief Data Officers team within Scottish Government. Um, and I actually chair the Scottish Remote Sensing Working Group as well. Um, and as Ulrich said, um, we have uh, funded uh, this uh, simple ARD service uh, for on behalf of the Scottish public sector. And I really just wanted to give a little bit of background to why we think this um, this particular service is, is really important. So. I mean, within Scottish Government and the Scottish public sector, we're trying to develop a little bit of a roadmap around the use of Earth observation data. And I guess Simple ARD is part of that bigger picture. 
And that bigger picture is to ensure that the Scottish public sector has access to the right skills, infrastructure and data to enable them to be an intelligent user of Earth observation data and applications. So if we think about simple ARD and kind of the reasoning why you know this is really important to our community, I guess the first is that it supports that mainstreaming of the use of Earth observation data. So the creation of, of ARD just takes away a lot of the burden that would sit with individual organisations uh, to uh, uh, create that data themselves from uh, some of the Copernicus feeds. And um, so, you know, it, it will it will help with that mainstreaming. Um, it's going to be able to demonstrate the benefit of analysis ready data through a number of different pilots. And um, so there there are specific um, uh, uh, bits of work that we're going to be supporting as part of the Simple ARD service. And um, those include um, the, uh, uh, the Scottish crop map um, and also some work around illegal waste. But there's lots of other pilots um, that um, other organisations within Scotland uh, we're hoping we'll be able to use this analysis ready data to help them uh, build, uh, build that bigger case for operationalising uh, the use of EO. And I guess that brings me on to the, the third point, um, which is um, that the Simple ARD service will also provide not just the data, but also some of the analytical infrastructure that we would need to help us turn these pilots into more operational applications. So that's giving uh, people access to uh, virtual machines as well, so that we can actually run code and um, carry out analysis on the data as well. And then I guess the final aspect um, of the service that, um, you know, again, really helping us ensure that the Scottish public sector has got that right skills and infrastructure and data is looking at um, uh, developing some technical skills within Scottish organisations. So GNCC will be helping people to understand how to use this data and the analytical infrastructure as well. So, I mean, that was a very quick run through of, um, I guess, the, the reasoning why, the background to um, why the simple ARD service is really important to Scotland. And I hope um, all of you that are on the line from Scottish organisations um, make the most of this service. Um, and feedback to us about uh, how you're using it um, and what benefits you've had from it, because all of this will help us think about where we go um, uh, in the future. So I think that was everything for me. So I'm going to hand back over to Ulrich again. Thank you, Shona. Um, Ian, would you like to give uh, the view from Northern Ireland, please? Hello. Hi. I'm uh, Ian Davies. Um, evidence uh, team leader within uh, Northern Ireland Environment Agency, Natural uh, Environment Division. And um, we actually came at this project um, or at this um, this new data service really um, from a, a position of a particular need, a particular evidence need um, uh, that NIA as uh, fulfilling its role, its primary purpose, protecting and enhancing Northern Ireland environment. Uh, we had a a growing need for a comprehensive regional scale um, habitat land cover map that was current, repeatable, could be iterative, um, as a strong evidence from which to assess natural capital, elements of habitat, condition, monitoring change, um, and ability to enhance modeling capabilities. Um, we developed with in conjunction with GNCC and um, this living maps approach, which used utilized the Sentinel data from the Copernicus program. Um, and uh, we uh, we developed quite a lot of uh, cleaning, processing um, of, of data from uh, the Copernicus program to be analysis ready. Um, and it covered the seasons, um, had representative samples across the seasons. Um, and it was quite quite a, quite an effort. And also, um, as time went on, we also then, through our collaborative working with EU working groups in the UK, um, and some of these pilot projects that Shona has mentioned, um, it became clear to us that there were absolutely numerous other potential dynamic applications um, that could take use of these uh, Sentinel-1 and 2 data sets, particularly for Northern Ireland, uh, such as wildfire monitoring, reporting, uh, forest da damage, storm damage, reporting, also potential uh, regulatory type um, um, monitoring, such as waste dumping. Um, uh, so I think uh, we then realized that rather than approaching um, 
these individual projects or these to be um, uh, emerging projects um, on a on an ad hoc basis, um, cleaning and correcting individual scenes of EO data as and when the project developed. It is much more sensible um, to actually have a structured um, approach to this data and to actually see if we could create an analysis ready data service. JNCC have taken that on, supported by the Scottish Government in Northern Ireland. Um, and that service has now actually taken shape. So this is now established an efficient, flexible data infrastructure from which to access ARD. Um, and this is produced to analytical standards that are actually consistent with a similar um, service um, through DEFRA in England. So there is a kind of a UK standardization of this, this data. Um, and I can't really emphasize enough how, how much effort goes into cleaning and correcting that raw data to have it desktop ready for the user. And we do think that that will actually now spur on um, with the public sector, academia and partners, uh, it certainly will spur on and offer potential for greater uh, environmental collaboration, research, innovation and uh, sophistication in the use of earth observation uh, data across Northern Ireland. Um, so it's really there for you, the audience and uh, others um, to actually um, take, take up See, see, see what potential applications um, that you can actually use this data for, and um, there will be um, support and elements of uh, training around this service as well. So uh, we hope you do uh, take advantage of it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, so to give a bit of an overview, and um, Ian touched on it there uh, about the relationship with data for. Um, England and also Wales. So uh, the origins of this are in a group uh, started by DEFRA called the Earth Observation Centre of Excellence, but which was then joined by Scotland and Northern Ireland uh, and Northern Irish uh, and Welsh organisations. And the, the requirement and uh, opportunity for producing a, a single source of ARD for others to then develop into their applications was clearly identified. Uh, unfortunately, we're, the, the funding that DEFRA provided um, has been put into what is at the moment uh, an England only service. And in the long term, I think there are still ambitions to make that a UK rather than just uh, uh, an England only service. So um, the uh, simple ARD service was developed to an extent as a response to that. Um, but we've been very careful uh, and GNCC have been involved in uh, the Earth Observation Data Service of, uh, for England that DEFRA have developed. We've been quite closely involved in that and that's how we've been able to um, develop common standards and to make sure that the data, the complementary data that's produced by the simple ARD service um, is uh, interchangeable and you can work with that uh, the data from both sources um, uh, in a seamless manner. Uh, and this is the, uh, we're generating and supplying the Central 1 and 2 uh, ARD and we have a, um, uh, a bit of an archive at the moment and I'll talk a bit more about that um, later. Um, but the, the data sources where we're archiving the data that's being produced here the DEFRA Earth Observation Data Service are archiving their data in the same location. So um, this will be a data set that covers Northern Ireland, um, Scotland, England, and at the moment there is significant overlap into Wales, although Wales isn't fully covered. Uh, and I think in the future, they'll, there's definitely plans to try and um, improve coverage, uh, both temporally and spatially. Um, but for the moment, the simple ARD service covers uh, uh, Northern Ireland and Scotland, and that's what we'll be uh, talking about today. Um, so if I can pass over to Grau to give a bit of technical detail on the um, Copernicus programme. Thanks, Ulrich. Um, so I will start by introducing the Copernicus programme because uh, this is the programme that provides us with the raw data. 
Um, it is the most ambitious Earth observation programme to date, um, and it is funded by the European Commission. Um, but the missions and services are delivered by partners such as the European Space Agency, UMETSAT, and others. Um, Copernicus delivers operational data sets um, by ob observing our environment, um, primarily using a suite of satellites called the Sentinels. Um, it collects, stores and analyzes data and provides products and services openly and freely available to everybody globally for a wide range of applications. Um, so, as already mentioned, the Simple ARD service focuses on the missions Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2. Next slide, please. Um, so what is analysis ready data? Um, we've already started slipping into using the ARD acronym without introducing uh, properly what analysis ready data means. Um, so unfortunately, the data delivered by many satellite data providers is not supp supplied in a ready to use format. And the data first needs to go through a set of processing steps, or, or sometimes we call them pre-processing steps. Um, for passive remote sensing sensors or optical data, which is the image you see on the right hand side, um, most users need a surface reflectance measurement. So we need to remove the effects of the atmosphere and mask clouds before we can do any analysis. While for active remote sensing, which is uh, uh, an image represented on the bottom of the slide, um, they are a bit more complex and many different types of products can be created from the raw data. Um, the products that we've chosen to focus on from radar data is a backscatter product, uh, and I will explain more what that means in a second. So we know what the processes need to be carried out, and we know what they are, so they can be centralised and they can be automated uh, in the most part. So knowing this means we can centralise the processing and eliminate duplication of effort, um, and this massively reduces the barriers of uptake to the data. And um, it can save up to 70% of project time based on work we carried out at the beginning of the analysis ready data journey um, nearly five years ago now. Um, we know that these ARD products will not be suitable for 100% of applications, but our analysis demonstrates that we currently hit about 80% of the potential applications within the public sectors uh, where we did our focused our analysis <coughs> with the current suite of ARD products. So the cost efficiencies do speak for themselves. Um, so before th the, estab the establishment of the Earth Observation Data Service in England and the Simple ARD Service for Scotland and Northern Ireland. We at JNCC, who've been integral in developing the processing chains in collaboration with partners from academia and uh, industry, um, we were processing data on demand for people. Um, next slide, please. Um, so there are two ARD products available. Um, the first is a backscatter product from Sentinel-1, which is a radar mission. There are currently two satellites operating within this mission. Um, the frequency of observing is every six days at the equator, um, but this increases uh, with higher latitudes. So parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland will see images every two to three days. Um, it is not complete nationwide coverage every two to three days, um, but Paula can show you later on what the coverage looks like. Um, this data is unaffected by cloud and can capture data day and night. Um, the spatial resolution of the ARD product is 10 meter squared pixels, uh, and you get a two band raster cloud optimized geotiff. Um, so our ARD product is a backscatter product. So what is backscatter? Um, it looks like this image on the bottom right hand of the screen, um, and it measures surface roughness. Um, it's not the easiest data to interpret visually, um, but hopefully you can see that structurally complex areas such as cities are bright. So you can see the city of Glasgow here um, and they have therefore have high backscatter values, while smoother surfaces like water bodies are darker and therefore have lower backscatter values. Um, even with analysis ready radar data um, can be complex data sets to work with and JNCC will be running a radar training session specifically designed for use in the public sector later on in this year if you're interested to hear more. Next slide. 
Um, the second ARD product is a surface reflectance product from Sentinel-2. Um, this is an optical data set, so it is a little bit, little bit easier to interpret than radar data, as it produces outputs um, that are similar to how we would see the world from space with our own eyes. Um, if you're familiar with the use of aerial photography, then this data is very similar. Again, it has two satellites in orbit with a similar frequency to Sentinel-1, um, but unfortunately this data is affected by cloud. So if, you, if you've got cloud present in the atmosphere, uh, then we will not be able to collect imagery uh, underneath, underneath the cloud. Um, the data is useful for visualization, but the sensors collect data beyond the visible part of the spectrum into the near infrared and shortwave infrared. Um, and this allows us to see landscape properties such as vegetation productivity and fires, for example. Um, so the image that you will get as an ARD product is a 10 band raster uh, cloud optimized geotiff at 10 meter squared pixels spatial resolution. Um, so I'll now hand over to Ulrich for the next couple of slides. Thanks, Gwar. So the, in terms of the, the uh, data processing standards, these were developed with um, uh, the Earth Observation Centre of Excellence partners to try and ensure that the standards that were arrived at were as applicable as possible. Uh, but as Gwar said, there will always be applications that require specific alternative processing but we expect that uh, most common applications will benefit from this these initial standards um, the processing chains were developed by uh, JNCC and we've based them all on open source software uh, and the key sort of principal pieces of software for the central one analysis is produced by the European Space Agency it's a snap toolbox for um, radar data for central one um, but the atmospheric correction in the Sentinel-2 data is done using a piece of software called ArcC, um, produced by Aberystwyth University. And uh, the DEFRA's Earth Observation Data Service, EODS, uses the same standards and the same principal processing tools, which allows us to generate the data from two different sources and then bring it together at the Scottish border. The uh, the workflow is um, uh, we pull down the data, uh, we call it raw data, but it's a, it's a level one product. Some processing has been done on it, but it's not something you can just open up on your desktop and use. Uh, and that's drawn from uh, one of the uh, DS platforms, one called Mundi Web Services. And we process this on uh, the Jasmine, uh, I love the super data cluster at uh, STFC. So this is part of the UK's um, uh, national science infrastructure that we are, um, we've been uh, able to get access to. Um, and the, excuse me, the, um, uh, the outputs, uh, we use a, um, a huge compute capacity uh, on Jasmine to process this data um, and then the outputs, the ARD and the metadata that goes uh, with each product and there's metadata at the data set level but also every single image has uh, some additional uh, metadata stored with it. That's made available um, uh, via the CDAR archive so you'll hear us talking about CDAR and that's the Center for Environmental Data Analysis. Um, and that is uh, 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 run by the Science and Technology Facilities, Facilities Council um, in uh, Oxfordshire. So the staff and compute resources for doing that are supported by the uh, Scottish Government and DERA and then the storage and distribution from this, the CEDAR archive is um, uh, underwritten by the National Centre for Earth Observation who um, uh, Come from the um, science and academic community but they're very keen that the science community will use the same data so they are underwriting the, the storage costs uh, and the distribution over the internet. This isn't uh, the simple ARD service is not fully automated um, the DEFRA's Earth Observation Data Service is much more automated um, but uh, uh, our infrastructure 
is rather on a different scale. Um, so we process in batches um, uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, and once the data has been processed, there's a quality assurance, quality control stage. Um, so samples are taken from each of the processing runs to uh, uh, just double check that um, there's nothing systematic going wrong with the data, uh, the data processing, or that there's any obvious uh, anomalies. And as part of the um, processing, the uh, Scottish data is um, projected to the British National Grid, whereas that for Northern Ireland uses the um, Irish National Grid um, for the output products. And as part of the QA, we use um, uh, QGIS to look at the band responses and the layer uh, reflectance curves um, uh, for pixels to make sure that the response is uh, appropriate for different types of habitats. There's then, a, uh, once the QA has been done, there's an ingestion step into the CEDAR archive. And so overall, the latency between the, um, the capture of the data by the satellite to when it might appear available for your use is um, between seven to 14 days because we do a week's worth in a batch and it takes, it's often quicker, but that's our sort of target is to make this date available on a seven to 14 day uh, latency. So clearly this is it's not an emergency service, but there is uh, the capacity to uh, expedite processing uh, for specific instances uh, mediated through uh, uh, Shona and uh, Ian. So the archive itself, uh, I think we've, for Scotland and Northern Ireland, we have a continuous archive from February 2019 to the present. Um, England has a slightly longer archive from o uh, October 2018. And, but we are, um, as Gwawa, explained we've been doing a range of um, uh, ad hoc request based processing over time and there are sources of additional data that we hope will be able to be incorporated into the data uh, into this archive to extend it further back in history if you like. The data itself uh, courtesy of CEDAR is being made publicly available and is open data um, so it's free to use uh, free to use for any year. Uh, purpose. Uh, so now I think I'll hand back to um, Guao to give a snapshot or an overview of a number of the applications that the ARD can be uh, used for. Thanks Ulrich. Um, so yes, I am going to give you a little bit of a flavour of work that's either currently ongoing or what it can be used for. And I'm using examples from a, a range of stakeholders and partners. So um, look out for the logos on each of the screen uh, or each of the slides because they're the ones carrying out this work. Um, the first and most common use of ARD data is habitat or land cover mapping. Um, knowing where things are in the landscape is a primary data input for many spatial data analysis and Earth observation provides an opportunity to not only create baseline maps um, but create maps that can be updated regularly. Um, the example you're seeing here is work being carried out by Space Intelligence and Nature Scott, uh, and they used optical data and artificial intelligence to map the Cairngorms as input for um, natural capital asset index calculations. Um, I'm sure that this map can also be used for many other applications also. Next slide, please. Um, another example of a habitat map that is currently being produced is work that we at JNCC are doing with the Northern Ireland Environment Agency, uh, which Ian mentioned at the beginning. Um, and this is to produce a nationwide habitat map for Northern Ireland. Um, so this mapping method uses both Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2 data and is already picking up data provided by the simple ARD service. Um, the map you're seeing here is of Fermanagh uh, and this work will now move on towards running the method for all the counties in Northern Ireland this year. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Um, so the frequency of the data allows us to detect changes in the landscape as they happen. Um, the example shown here is a project that first started a few years ago and ran by Forest Research. 
um, and primarily it uses Sentinel-1 data to detect young trees. Um, but the method uh, does work for detecting felling activities uh, and is being adapted by forest research, I think, uh, and can be used to update the National Forest Inventory. Um, one of the key functionality of change detection from Earth observation, in my opinion, is to the ability to be able to target site visits. So knowing um, something hasn't changed in the landscape is just as valuable as knowing where change has occurred, because uh, it can be used to target field visits and uh, uh, introduce costs, savings and efficiencies. Next example, please. Um, another example by Nature Scott, uh, where they used our Sentinel-2 ARD data to map seagrass. Um, this is to demonstrate that the data can be used in shallow marine environments, and it has a lot of untapped potential in the coastal zone in particular, I think. Um, there are, however, limitations to working with remote sensing data underwater, of course, um, but it is possible to get useful data in clear waters up to 10, uh, sometimes 15 metres depth, depending on water conditions and turbidity, etc. Um, these highly dynamic environments are particularly difficult to map on the ground, so the frequency of satellite data may be a valuable resource in this case. Um, it is worth noting that our ARD product has been optimised for terrestrial applications, um, so we've already mentioned that our ARD hits currently about 80% of applications. Now, while you can use the ARD data like Nature Scots have done here, it is possible to apply a different set of pre-processing techniques to maximize the information captured from satellite data for water applications. So that's worth bearing in mind. Next slide, please. So wildfire is something that we've seen a lot more of over the last few years in particular. Um, this is an example of using Sentinel-2 to detect and map burn extent in Northern Ireland. Um, the figure on the top of the slide is an example of visualising the imagery beyond the visible. Um, so the three images are pre, during and after a fire. Uh, the top three uh, are visualized in true color, which is what we see with our own eyes, while the bottom three are exactly the same images, but we're visualizing the shortwave infrared part of the data. Now in the during fire image, you'll see a bright red um, area in the image, and that is showing us the extent of the fire. Um, and you will notice that you can't see the same thing in the true color image. So this demonstrates that um, satellite images that see beyond the visible can provide us with valuable information. It is worth noting that Nature Scott have also done uh, quite a lot of work uh, using Sentinel-2 to data to map wildfires in Scotland as well. Next slide, please. Um, another mapping example, but this time for crops. Uh, Shona has already mentioned the Crop Map Scotland project. Um, and this project takes advantage of the dense time series of Sentinel-1 data to detect crop cycles uh, and, uh, and map them. So it is a focused mapping output. Um, and this work is currently being carried out by Scottish Government. And the way that the simple ARD service project is supporting um, the Crop Map Pro for Scotland project is we're supplying the project team with the virtual machine space next the data on um, STFC's infrastructure to help them carry out their analysis. Uh, next slide, please. Um, last example from me today is again using the dense time series of Sentinel-1 data to monitor water levels of lakes in Fermanagh in Northern Ireland. Um, as you can see from the Sentinel-2 image on the right, there is a bit of variety in water levels within year, and ground stations are probably quite expensive to uh, maintain. So this data can complement those ground networks that already exist to monitor water levels. Next slide. Um, so there are many more examples, which I have listed here. Um, oh, well, I've listed some of them here. Um, don't worry too much about reading all of these right now, because you can come back to the slides at a later date. But it's just to demonstrate that the potential uses of these data sets really are vast and they are an untapped potential and this service will hopefully help fuel um, some more applications and move them into operational use. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Paula who will take you through how to access the CEDA archive and get your, get your hands on the data. 
Okay, thank you very much, Guaua. Um, so there clearly are lots of possible applications for the data. Um, I hope that's whetted your appetite. Um, and just to reiterate, although the aim of the Simple ARD service is supporting public sector applications, the data are freely available to anyone use. Um, they're under an open government license. So that does cover commercial as well as non-commercial use. Um, you can create products from the data, include them in services that you provide, and um, you can use it for academic research, all we ask is that you acknowledge the data um, and you can find information on our website on how to acknowledge the data in products or services you create and also how to cite it in research papers. Um, before I show you how to access the data on CEDA, I just wanted to say a little bit about how the data is supplied to you because they're um, kind of chopped up into manageable sized chunks to make it easier to download and to store. Um, so for Sentinel-1, this is called Scenes, um, and these cover the full width of the orbit swath, and then they're about 170 kilometers high, and each file is around four gigabytes. Whereas for Sentinel-2, um, these, uh, these were supplied in square tiles, which are exactly 100 by 100 kilometers square, and they're called granules. Each one is around about between 1.2 to 1.8 gigabytes, so a little bit smaller. Um, now the Sentinel-1 satellites have a 12-day repeat cycle with 175 orbits per cycle, that's covering the whole world. Um, Scotland and Northern Ireland are covered by 12 Sentinel-1 orbits. Um, there are seven ascending orbits, which you can see here. Um, and if you remember the example scene I showed on the previous slide, um, you can see that that is on orbit number 30, that one that covers a little bit of, of the borders and uh, the Isle of Arran there. Um, so as you can see from this, and Ulrich alluded to earlier, a single orbit doesn't cover the whole of our area of interest of Scotland and Northern Ireland. But because we've got new data being captured every few days, you will get complete coverage every five to six days. Uh, and then there's uh, five descending orbits, which you can see here. Um, and an important thing to point out with both the ascending and the descending orbits is that the footprints of the scenes don't actually align exactly with each other in imagery of different dates. Um, there could be, as you can see from the close up, a few tens of meters or even two or 300 meters difference. Um, and the pixels in the imagery don't align exactly either. And um, just to make you aware that this is what's expected, it's not a fault of the ARD and the actual features in the imagery, um, the things like roads and bridges do align perfectly. Um, it's just the pixels. Um, you can see towards the bottom of the imagery here, um, some of these scenes are so large that they actually cover a bit of Scotland and a bit of Northern Ireland in the same scene. And these ones are processed twice by the Simple ARD service, once producing an output in the British National Grid projection and once in the Irish National Grid projection. So if you see them twice, that's why. Um, for Sentinel-2, um, the Simple ARD service provides 10 granules over Northern Ireland and 41 granules over Scotland. Um, and each of the <clears throat> granules, as you can see here, has a unique alphanumeric code. Um, and the first two numbers of that code are the UTM zone, um, the Universal Transverse Mercator Zone. Um, and our area of interest is covered by three zones. So you've got 29, 30 and 31. Uh, here again, we've got three granules, um, which cover both Scotland and Northern Ireland. And as with Sentinel-1, these are processed twice um, using each country's national grid as the coordinates ref coordinate reference system in each case. Um, and now there's three Sentinel-2 orbits that cover both Scotland and Northern Ireland, and they're shown here. And as you can see, again, this doesn't cover the whole area of interest in one go, but within five or six days, you will get complete coverage. And then there's a further two orbits that just cover um, Scotland. Now, Sentinel-2 is different to Sentinel-1 because it's provided in this gridded format. Um, the boundaries of the granules and the pixels within them do align perfectly in imagery from different dates. Now, I'm going to go on and show you how to access the data in the CEDA archive. Um, and that's the Centre for Environmental Data Analysis. Um, and we've got the um, Sentinel-1 and 2 analysis ready data for England and a large part of Wales, um, as we mentioned earlier, also available through CEDA, provided through the DEFRA Earth Observation Data Service, process the same analytical standards so you can use CEDA to get the data for UK wide analysis. Um, and these services are provided on behalf of NERC through the National Centre for Atmospheric Science and National Centre for Earth Observation. Um, and this is all based in um, RAL space, STFC uh, near Oxford. 
Um, so I put some website links on these slides. We are going to make the slides available on our website, so you'll be able to come back and reference all of this. Um, and I'm going to demonstrate some of these links now. Um, but if you want to refer back to slides for any of these information, we are going to share them. So without further ado, go on to the website. Um, now I've gone into um, the URL you can see here. It's the um, National Earth Observation Data Centre, Sentinel ARD and data. So that's taking us straight to our analysis ready data. Um, and these are the index pages with options to see the Sentinel-1 or the Sentinel-2 data indexed by date. So I'm going to start off by showing you Sentinel-1. And we've got three years of um, data at the moment, as we explained. So it's, it's this, um, our archive. Um, as we do make more data available, you'll see earlier years available there as well. But for now, let's look at 2019. Um, I'll just refresh that. Right, there we go. Um, and you can see now all of the 12 months available for 2019. I'm going to have a look at July and see what imagery was available for, say, this day last year. So we'll look at the 30th of July. And now you can see there's quite a lot of data in Sentinel-1 captured on the um, 30th of July last year. And what you can see here is that there's two files for each data set. Um, there's the um, TIFF, uh, GeoTIFF, um, which is the data itself, that's this large four-ish gigabyte files, and then the metadata XML file, which is much smaller. Um, and the file names are exactly the same in both of these, apart from having meta on the end for the metadata file. I'm going to say a little bit about the file naming convention, just because there's some really useful information in here that can help you find what you're looking for. Um, so um, the file names begin with telling you the sensor, so it's either Sentinel 1A or B, then it tells you the date, so we've got 30th of July 2019, and then we've got the orbit, so we've got orbit 103, which covers West Scotland and a large part of Northern Ireland, you can refer to the slides to see what's covered by each orbit, and as we scroll down we've got some orbit 96 and orbit 8 there as well, so that gives you a clue into what you're going to get. Um, and then we've got whether it's an ascending orbit or a descending orbit, so it's got ASC or DESC in the name. And then these numbers are the acquisition time in hours, minutes and seconds, so all of this imagery was captured around six o'clock in the afternoon. Um, and then the latter part of the file name, this is all to do with the, um, the technical processing side of things, and there's more information on this in the metadata if you're interested. Um, but so the VVVH means it's dual polarization, V standing for vertical and H for horizontal. Um, gamma zero is the radiometric calibration. Um, but this is useful information. We've got the um, either NI or GB telling you if it's Northern Ireland or, um, or, or Scotland or it could be English data as well because that's telling you what digital elevation model was used in the processing. And then either OSGB or TM65 tells you um, which uh, coordinate reference system the output is in. So it's very easy to isolate and find the Northern Irish data that you're looking for. Um, and then RTCK is the um, radiometric normalization method. And this, this is speckle reduction refined least. So I'll say there's information about that in the metadata with links and, and uh, references if you want. Um, so what I would do is find the, um, there's a couple of Northern Ireland data sets on Orbit 103. So I would just click on the download file to get hold of those. Um, downloads can take a while, depending on your internet collection. So I've actually done both of these earlier and we'll have a look at those in a minute. Um, but first of all, I just want to show you the Sentinel two index pages so I'll go back to data and this time we'll have a look at Sentinel 2 and we'll look at something more recent now we'll look at 2020 and I'm going to look at late April because I know it was really sunny and nice weather around then so we'll look at the 22nd of April because I know there was um, some clear imagery um, now there's a lot of data sets you can see here um, and the file names here they've got the unique um, a tile reference in the name, so that makes it easy to search. Um, I'm going to look for a tile that I will know covers a bit of Scotland and Northern Ireland. So I'm just going to type in UUF and see. So T30 UUF, I know what, that that tile is one that I'm interested in. And what we can see here is that there are seven files all for that one granule. So we've got um, the cloud mask, um, a saturated pixel mask, a topographic shadow mask. Um, so this is 
things that you can use to mask out um, pixels that say are obscured by cloud or obscured by shadow that you wouldn't want to use in an analysis. Um, valid pixel mask, and then we've got the data itself, so in this case, a 1.2 gigabyte file, the metadata, and also um, a thumbnail, which I could hopefully have a look at that. Um, so there we can see we've got a bit of um, Dumfries and Galloway and Strangford Loch and a bit of Isle of Man. So you can see what you're going to get before you take the plunge and actually download it, which um, I would do by clicking the download file. If you want the ancillary data like clouds, topographic shadow, download those as well. So again, I have done that earlier on. Um, and you can see on the file names here um, that we've got um, the date, you know, so we've got the, sen the sensor first, Sentinel 2A uh, or B, um, the date of acquisition, but slightly different Sentinel 1, we've got the latitude and longitude, then the unique uh, reference that tile, the orbit it's on, the projection system it was collected in, and then the projection system that it was um, produced in. So these, this one is the one processed using the British National Grid. Okay, so I'm going to now, um, we'll open GIS and have a look at the data. Um, so I'm using QGIS, this is free and open source software, everyone has access to this. Um, we'll have a look at the Sentinel-1 data first of all, so that's the two scenes I've downloaded. Um, and if I expand this, uh, hopefully it's not too small, you can see that um, <clears throat> the low values, so going down to minus 38, is, is darker on the map, and the high values, the high backscatter, is brighter on the map. As Guao said earlier, so the sea, the water's very dark, and the um, urban areas are much brighter. Um, we'll have a look at the Sentinel-2. So that's nice and clear. Um, if we zoom in to an area now, so this is um, North and South Woodburn Reservoirs here. And if we zoom in, we can see that we've got some water bodies, some wooded areas, um, some cleared areas, and then grassland and arable all around it. Um, so that's quite visible in the optical imagery. But if we then turn that off and have a look at the, um, the radar data, you can see the water bodies very clearly standing out because they've got low backscatter. Um, the woodland, because that's topographically complex, got very high values, and the kind of grassland and arable is something in between. Um, so I'll just put the um, this imagery back on. We can visualize this in different ways, because as Guao said, there's loads of bands that we've got available to play with. So I will do a false color visualization um, using the near infrared, the red, and the green. And now you can see, well, the water bodies are very dark. They're really standing out clearly. You can see the urban areas clearly delineated, um, wooded areas, like there's up here some woodland, and then here around the reservoirs, again, really clearly standing out. So, I mean, hopefully this shows that it could be really useful to use Sentinel-1 and 2 together um, for analysis for things like habitat mapping, crop mapping, um, detecting flooding, um, detecting bare soil, because, you know, we've got some plowed fields here, they stand out very clearly. Bare soil could be a risk for erosion and runoff. So there's lots you can do with this data. Um, <clears throat> I'm just gonna put that back to our normal uh, red and green and blue, like the way we like to see things because it makes sense to us. Um, and I will just show that I've downloaded a little bit more data here, which we can have a look at. Um, so yeah, I downloaded about um, 13 uh, granules there and put them all together. And just to show that you can make a really nice mosaic if I wanted to, I could do the whole of Scotland, do England as well. Um, and that's really nice and useful for visualization and backdrop mapping. And you can create those you know, at least as often as you get cloud-free days. Um, <clears throat> so the last thing that I wanted to show you was um, finding the data through CEDAR's GeoSearch tool. And that's the... Um, satellite data finder that's um, uh, shown here and our analysis ready data was just added to this um, yesterday so that's very exciting I hope you're going to go in and have a play with that um, so it's an interactive map that you can use to find what data is available for an area of interest by either drawing a rectangle on it or just zooming into an area of interest that works as well um, and because that will give you a lot of data it's a good idea to start with a date filter so um, I'll just like do the start of January this year, um, give it a few days, like maybe just the first five days of the year. And you can access 
a lot of other uh, satellite data sources through this. So I'm going to untick that and just tick the boxes for our analysis ready data. So you can see it's got ARD on the end. That's our data. Um, so I'm going to do all of those and go apply filters. This will probably give me, so that gives you quite a lot of data. Um, and at the side, you can see how many um, Sentinel-1 seams are available for your area of interest and how many Sentinel-2 granules. Um, as you zoom in, so you can see those numbers are decreasing because you've filtered it to an area of interest. Um, and then if you want to look at a particular one, you can click on it. So this should be the one we looked at earlier. So it's the um, that same Sentinel-1 seen on Orbit 30, which covers the borders and the Isle of Arran. Um, so having found that, um, normally there would be a, a JPEG preview here, so you can have a look as well. But you could click to download or click here to view it in the directory, which will take you back to those index pages that I showed before, um, which is good if you're interested in just one or two uh, scenes or granules. Um, but the other thing that you can do is um, click on export results, um, which then gives you the option of for all of the um, all of the scenes or granules in your area of interest to get the um, the information as raw JSON text, file paths, or download URLs that you can then download the data that you need or include that in in some code. So. I hope you're going to log in and have a look at that. Um, I'm going to go back to the presentation now. Because um, uh, you can also access the data programmatically. Um, and we are hoping to produce some documentation on this and some examples um, that will be available through our website soon. Um, but in the meantime, um, there is some very good guidance on the CEDA website, um, which again, you can go back to these slides to get these um, URLs. Um, you can access the data through Elasticsearch or OpenDAP API. So you can actually uh, access the data into kind of an automated workflow programmatically. Um, we are running a project at the moment um, in collaboration with CEDA and with DEFRA um, to support code sharing and knowledge exchange um, for users of analysis ready data across the UK. Um, and this is funded through the Copernicus Framework Partnership Agreement for Copernicus User Uptake. There's a whole um, very useful page about that on our website that's got lots of stuff about the projects we're running, um, workshops, training events, um, like the radar training that Guawa mentioned earlier. Um, and as part of this project, we are going to be setting up a code sharing platform, um, which we'll be using GitHub for that, um, for you know specifically for scripts that are using analysis ready data in the UK, um, and some kind of um, question and answer forum so users can help each other and get some peer support. Um, and we're still looking into what platform will be best for that, but um, aiming to have it all set up by September. And we're having a webinar on the 24th of September to um, launch these things and promote them. Um, and there'll be information on our website about that very soon. Um, so here's a Here's the URL for the um, analysis, simple ARD service pages on our website. Um, and on this, you can find some of the information we've provided here, some information about the data itself, but in a bit more detail, um, some of the environmental applications, and we'll keep adding to that as the project goes on. Um, there will be a user guide um, as a downloadable PDF, all about the data and how to access it. So that will be on there very soon. Um, and of course, the slides from this presentation and the recording of this webinar will be on there. Um, and we've got an FAQ section as well. So if you've got any questions, have a look there first, see if it's been asked. Um, whoops. And there is also um, email support provided up until the end of February at least. If you email this address, earthobs at jncc.gov.uk, um, with any questions about the Simple ARD service, um, then we will get back to you with questions about, with answers to your questions. Um, and then as Ulrich mentioned, if you need data processing urgent, urgently, um, maybe for um, after a wildfire or flooding event, um, then you could also contact us through this to ask about that and putting urgent in the um, uh, in, in the message title. Um, so I think that's that's all from me. Um, and we just wanted to finish up by saying thank you very much to um, the people who made this possible. So um, Scottish Government and um, 
DERA Northern Ireland Environment Agency for funding it and providing so much support. Um, the Centre for Environmental Data Analysis, CEDA, for obviously providing all the um, technical infrastructure, both for processing the data and also for sharing it, making it publicly available to everyone. That's brilliant. Um, and all our colleagues at JNCC, because obviously it's not just me or Rick and Guao who've done this work. There's a lot of people working very hard on this, on actually um, developing the workflows, training others, doing the processing, doing the quality control, which has been very rigorous and people have spent a lot of time on that and making sure the data is fit for purpose. Um, so thanks to all our colleagues. Um, and then also in Scotland, there is a remote sensing working group. I expect some of the audience are members of this and we've probably heard about the webinar through it. Um, but that's been a really useful um, sounding board as we've been developing this project, you know, getting, um, speaking to people about what they would need from the service and what applications they're interested in. Um, and we are in the process of setting up a similar kind of group for Northern Ireland. So I think that's going to be very useful there as well. Um, and finally, as Ulrich mentioned at the start, but this, this all started with the DEFRA Earth Observation Centre of Excellence. So thank you to them for um, making it all possible. And uh, we're going to, uh, hopefully some questions have been um, coming in. So um, I just want to say thank you to you all for listening. Um, thanks for dialing into this. Um, and I will hand back to Ulrich um, to chair and let us know if there's been any questions. Okay, thank you very much, Paul. That's excellent. Uh, and thank you to all of the, the speakers. Um, I'm delighted to say we have got a range of uh, questions um, uh, in response to what you've heard today. Uh, so I'll um, perhaps go through these and uh, I hope that uh, to make this a, a slightly more uh, human experience, we might, we might reveal ourselves so we can actually see some, have a little bit of human contact in these strange days we're living through. So, as we're all home workers these days. Um, so I'd like to, uh, I'll go through the questions in the order they arrived. I think some will have been answered as we've gone along, but I will just double check. So one is, uh, this may be for you, Ian, perhaps as uh, uh, one attendee is working on a cross-border green infrastructure project. Um, so do colleagues in the Republic of Ireland have access to similar, similar or compatible data sets? Uh, Ian, I think you're on mute. <laughs> good, good call there, Ulrich. Um, they certainly have access to the same um, core um, primary data set. Um, they will um, have their own um, sort of cleaning and correction um, of that uh, raw data into what will be an analysis ready data service. So I don't know the exact ch processing chain that they use, but certainly yes, they'll, they'll have access to the, the full complement of uh, Sentinel 1 and 2 data. So in, in theory, um, that collaboration should, should be able to uh, be worked by, as long as you understand the metadata behind each um, output product. Okay, Hi. thank you. Oh, Can I... Go on. Yeah, so as you will have seen throughout the presentation, we don't cut the imagery to country boundaries either. So a lot of the ARD data we're already producing for Northern Ireland will cover a large proportion of the Republic of Ireland as well in most cases. So it'll just be the outer fringe and the southern part, the most southern part of Ireland that won't be covered in the data that we're already producing for Northern Ireland. Okay, thank you. It's useful to, uh, to point out. Uh, are there plans to extend the service to cover England and Wales? Um, hopefully that was answered as we went along in that uh, uh, England uh, um, started their, their production uh, before the simple ARD service, that's the, the DEFRA Earth Observation Data Service, and that does, um, again, they don't clip to the country boundary, so they cover a significant portion of um, Wales, although it isn't full coverage. Um, so uh, the majority of the UK is now um, covered as part of this, um, but and that England data is available on the CEDAR archive from exactly the same location as uh, Paula was demonstrating earlier on. Um, so it is there, I think there are, there have always been ambitions that um, there should be a single UK uh, wide service uh, and 
those discussions will continue, but the genesis of the simple ARD service was to make sure that um, Scotland and Northern Ireland had the opportunities to develop their own uh, EO-based applications while that process hopefully comes to, uh, to fruition. If anybody's interested in Wales specific data, they have their own ARD similar to the Republic of Ireland, as Ian mentioned. Um, the Sentinel-2 data that they process uses the same exact software and processing chains as we do for the England Earth Observation Data Service and the Simple ARD Service for Scotland and Northern Ireland. It was developed by Aberystwyth University and we were part of the project at the beginning with the satellite applications catapult to develop these processing chains for Sentinel-2. Um, but the Sentinel-1 processing for Wales, they use um, a paid-for commercial software to produce their Sentinel-1 ARD, so it's slightly different. So um, the data is available if you go uh, to Welsh Government. Um, I think they can provide access to the data, but um, just in case you, uh, whoever asked that question was interested to know if there was any coverage in Wales specifically, there is. Okay, thank you, Ar. Um, uh, a very good question saying, uh, why are we doing all this processing from level one to level two, uh, given that um, uh, why are we not just downloading the products already produced by ESA? Um, Guau, do you want to uh, yeah. <laughs> take that one? Yeah, so um, we started thinking about analysis ready data as a concept back in 2015, and back then there wasn't any analysis ready data uh, go, going around um, and ESA definitely hadn't started producing any analysis ready data themselves um, so we decided to look into creating our own analysis ready data um, and producing a UK-wide standard and we did this through the conversations through the DEFRA Centre of Excellence very early on um, and since we started those uh, conversations everybody else in the world has kind of caught up so um, there, there's now lots of different types of analysis ready data products all over the world. Um, ESA do produce a level two product and it's a global standard, um, but there are issues with global level data. So if you're doing global uh, level analysis, then the global data set is probably okay. But if you're zooming in and wanting uh, national level data sets, then we can use better digital elevation models. We can use parameters that are specific to um, the conditions that we see in our countries. And a lot of other nations, uh, not just us, are producing their own national level analysis ready data. Um, France, for example, have uh, a very good analysis ready data standard and a data set as well. Um, so there is a, a lot of benefits of having control over the production of your own analysis ready data because you can establish that standard for for your nation and you don't have to worry about uh, you know the parameters that they're using at a global scale. Um, the ESA data for the UK is comparable to our own analysis ready data. Um, we did do a comparison exercise uh, with University College London a couple of years ago uh, and that project did demonstrate that the quality of our ARD for UK based applications was slightly better than the ESA ARD product. So uh, you know what, what you're getting is a better quality or a better suited um, more fit for purpose data for the UK specifically whereas the ESA one you know you can get regional uh, Europe-wide data at analysis ready data level so there is benefits to using uh, or creating your own ARD. And uh, I'd also just add to that that we're also projecting to British National Grid and Irish National Grid specifically so this is data that you can very quickly open up and use and combine with your own local data sets. Um, what software packages are we using? Um, so for the central one, I think we mentioned that we're using the SNAP toolbox from the European Space Agency. For central two, um, we're using uh, ARCSI software from uh, Aberystwyth University. Um, it's, uh, the software question is quite a big hole, but just to uh, dip down into it briefly, um, a lot of the process is uh, orchestrated using um, uh, Python-based libraries um, and uh, it's all Linux based. Uh, it makes use of uh, uh, 
GDAL and containerized processing using uh, Singularity that we run on uh, the amazing infrastructure at uh, Jasmine. Uh, uh, so I'll I'll leave it at that before we disappear into a um, a bit of a software hole there. Uh, how can we access the CDAR archive? Um, hopefully Paul has made that nice and clear. Um, there's a you can browse through. Um, you can use uh, search. The data is now uh, hot off the presses. It's now finding its way into the uh, the visual tool, the geo search, um, and the data is also accessible through um, uh, programmable APIs, application programming interfaces, and uh, uh, there'll be more information about how to do that uh, coming in the not too distant future. Uh, the next question, a 12 month archive was initially mentioned. Um, will the data archive be kept long term or will storage be an issue that means older images are removed from the archive? So um, this is one of the key benefits of our collaboration with um, the National Centre for Earth Observation and CEDAR in that uh, they have um, astonishing levels of infrastructure. Um, they're, they're currently archiving 43 petabytes of data, I think. Um, so the uh, the ARD, which I think uh, off the top of my head is something like 10 terabytes a year for um, Central 1 and 2 for Scotland and Northern Ireland. Um, uh, Although if you wanted to download it all in one go, you'd be waiting a long time. In terms of their infrastructure, it's not hugely significant. Uh, and so um, uh, they are, the plan is for this multi-year archive to just accumulate. Uh, and in the future, um, it's not impossible to think that that might become problematic, but given the scale of their infrastructure, um, this is an accumulating archive rather than a rolling archive. Just a comment to, on the seagrass work that you highlighted, um, uh, Gwawa, that uh, that example was done in the intertidal, uh, intertidal area at low tide rather than um, relying on uh, penetration through the water column. But I could add something to that, though, because um, we are actually using our Sentinel-2 analysis ready data um, in some collaborative research with Newcastle University at the moment. Um, and we're using the data to detect um, the crests of sandbanks in um, marine protected areas, um, which are sort of between five meters to 15 meters below the sea um, using satellite derived bathymetry using the green and blue bands um, and despite the turbidity of the North Sea because this is in the coast of Norfolk we are actually getting really good results and it is possible in certain conditions to um, to detect the seabed um, so so there, there is possibility for that and despite what Grau said about um, you know, it's not optimized for um, marine applications. It's really optimized for all the things like habitat mapping and crop mapping that we talked about, um, but it does work. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, is it possible to process images from CEDAR archive in the cloud instead of downloading one by one? Uh, that could potentially be uh, interpreted in other ways in that uh, you could, process it in the cloud and pull the data from the CEDAR archive. Uh, but I suspect the question refers to, is it possible to pr uh, put processing next to the data where it is? Um, and that is what we're starting to do with some of the um, exemplar applications that are being funded through the Copernicus user uptake and the simple ARD service. Um, it's not a general service that's available at the moment. Um, uh, because the, uh, the, that carries with some processing costs. Um, Shona, do you want to say anything about the uh, use in Scotland? Um, yeah, ma there's maybe um, two things here. So, I mean, Ulrich, you were mentioning, I guess, uh, the use of that of virtual machines for crop map, for example. Um, yeah. So that's one way to look at this. Um, I think um, there is potential within um, Scotland. We're looking at um, other 
uh, kind of analytical workbenches that were that would be in the in the cloud or sitting within um, Edinburgh Uni at the EPCC um, as well. So I mean that's still that's still a little bit of work that's underway right now. And um, so that could be another potential. Um, I guess the other way that you could maybe read this question is to do with um, web mapping services as well. So uh, the sort of generation of a WMS. Um, for uh, this, and we certainly talked about that at the Scottish Remote Sensing Working Group. And um, there's again, there's a little bit of work to be done on that um, uh, still. Um, but I, I guess there's there's a few potential options, um, none of which are necessarily there ready to go, but they are uh, things that we're thinking about. So if you, you know, if there are if there are specific projects um, that you would like to use virtual machines for, then please get in touch. Okay. Uh, and actually, the next question is uh, specifically directed to you, Shona. Um, it says, yes. for those of us on the, <laughs> those of us, uh, on the Scottish Government network, are there options yep. being looked at that would allow for downloads of several gigabytes in size? So perhaps related to the previous question. Uh, I think this is to do very specifically with if you sit within Scottish Government, um, we can't download anything over a couple of gigabytes. So it does put a little bit of a crimp when you're trying to do energy spatial work. Um, I don't off the top of my head know where this is. Um, it will be the, um, I'm, I'm pretty certain the GIS team in Scottish Government are looking at this. Um, so I don't have an answer for you right now, other than to say that some of the answers that I gave to the previous question about the potential um, to use virtual machines. So if you're within Scottish Government environment, there are uh, there is an analytical workbench that you will be able to um, sign up to um, and get access to. Um, so that could be a potential route around this, but I, I don't know, um, I, haven't, I haven't spoken to people to find out if that has solved that specific problem. But again, um, whoever asked this question can maybe get back in touch with me and we can pick it up. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, is this data available to be used in ArcGIS Pro or ArcGIS Desktop without any issues? Um, uh, I don't, the, I suppose there's two issues, one a technical and a licensing um, issue. The, the data is being produced as an open uh, government license and so that uh, there's, there's no bar on its reuse. Um, uh, from a technical point of view, um, it can certainly be used um, and we've read the data into um, ArcGIS. Um, I'm not familiar with the uh, and haven't used the ArcGIS server portal infrastructure um, specifically but I, I'd be very surprised if that was an issue. I think this might be a question about web services um, so obviously if you download the data um, it's a, a standard GeoTIFF file and you can open I, I demonstrated using um, QGIS because it's free and open source but yeah definitely can open it in um, Esri products of a GIS it's absolutely fine um, but I think the thing about can you upload these images I just wondered if that was a question about um, WMS web map services um, because that is something that we've been talking to um, Scotland and Northern Ireland about that's not currently provided by this service but we did a consultation with users um, earlier this year um, to look at what products or services it might be beneficial um, to have and that's, that's an ongoing piece of work. Um, the DEFRA's Earth Observation Data Service does provide um, web map services, WMS, that can let you stream the data into um, desktop GIS or corporate mapping systems without any of this horrible downloading and storing. Okay, so actually the, the same uh, attendee has reframed the question, perhaps I've just scrolled up and found uh, um, another version of the same question. Does, can you upload the images into ArcGIS server portal infrastructure for internal organisational sharing? Um, uh, I don't think that is a problem, that's the nature of the open government licence. So if you're able to within your uh, the arrangements you have with Esri for doing that, I don't think that that would be a problem. Um, ArcGIS Server allows you to access data sets using application programming interfaces as well and the CEDA archive does already have an API that you can link to via your ArcGIS infrastructure. 
so it's not WMS, it's a different access to the root, but the API already exists for the data, whereas the WMS do not uh, exist yet. So that could be a, a potential route for people who understand how to use APIs. Okay, and uh, while you're on Guao, I think the next one is for you. Um, it says, uh, is the Sentinel-2 data being processed for cloud removal by using Sentinel-1 and or Sentinel-2 previous date images? Um, if not so, is there any plan to extend the functionality of ARD to include this? Um, so unfortunately, can't re Sentinel-1 data doesn't really give us much information about cloud, so we can't really use Sentinel-1 data for cloud masking. Um, the current cloud masking that we're using um, is not great. It's okay, um, but there, during winter uh, periods in particular, it does struggle because it depends on brightness values in the Sentinel-2 imagery itself. Um, and we do cloud masking based on uh, the actual image itself. So we're not using a time series of image images to classify cloud, essentially. Um, not yet, anyway. Um, we do know that there are potential improvements that we can implement with not just the Sentinel-2 data cloud masking, but with Sentinel-1 as well. Um, and that is something that we're continuously asking ourselves. Um, and I have got a, a funded project this year looking at improvements that we can do for Sentinel-1 ARD backscatter, for example, because one of the issues is for Sentinel-1 is the radar frequency interference problem, which isn't consistent. Um, and we just need to find a way of masking that out in an automated way if, if that's possible um, but we do know that there are methods that do exist that use time series analysis to produce better cloud masks um, they're very compute intensive um, and you need at least um, 16 previous sentinel 2 cloud free dates um, to be able to run an effective cloud masking algorithm in this way um, so the French ARD data set I previously mentioned uses this uh, method to create cloud masks. Um, and, you know, this is one of the um, drawbacks of the whole mission for Sentinel-2, the fact that there's no thermal bands uh, being collected at the same time, like there is for Landsat. And the, the lack of that thermal information means that cloud masking is a particular problem for everybody globally for Sentinel-2 data sets. So we're not using uh, previous imageries to uh, cloud mask at the moment, um, but we know that the methods exist and we could potentially look at implementing some of those methods in the future. Um, so they'd need to then go through a bit of a vetting process as to how stable that method is. Um, can we you know, integrate it into our already automated processing chains? And that requires funding and resource that uh, it's very difficult to come by. So it might be a while before we get to that stage. But we do know that it's possible, but it's not currently implemented. OK. Um, I'm not sure if this is uh, uh, another one for uh, for yourself or for uh, perhaps for Paula, um, uh, is it possible to search on cloud cover? Uh, I guess cloud cover percentage and what cloud mask is currently being used? Uh, well, the, the cloud mask um, that is available to download with the Sentinel-2 data that's produced um, using the ArcC method. And I mean, a lot of it is very good, but as Aguara said, sometimes it does over predict or under predict. Um, and the cloud cover percentage is stored in the metadata. Um, it's not possible I think, to use that as a filter um, in the CEDA um, satellite data finder interactive map. It, that is functionality that's offered through the DEFRA EO data service. Um, but of course, that's only, you know, that's tailor made for us and that's only using the Sentinel 1 and 2 data. Of course, the, um, the CEDA facility is giving you access to a, a much wider range of, um, of, of Earth observation data, um, all different, you know, kind of air quality and marine data sets as well. Um, so it would probably be different, uh, probably difficult to um, standardize that to search by um, cloud cover like we can with the DEFRA data service. Um, I don't know yet because we're just starting to look into this whether that will be possible programmatically because the cloud cover percentage is in the metadata so it might be possible through API um, but I don't believe it's possible um, just through the portal you'd need to like click on the metadata and look at it. <laughs> okay thank you very much. Um, 
are the digital elevation models used compatible across national boundaries? Um, they certainly are uh, England, Wales and Scotland. They use a common uh, digital elevation model. Um, the digital elevation model in Northern Ireland is specific to that locality, I think. Gwau, can you uh, confirm? Wow, did you? Uh, she sat very still. I wonder if I think we're it's frozen. <laughs> yeah. Technical problem. So um, uh, the the digital elevation model is used in the processing. It's not uh, embedded in the outputs as such. So it's the uh, uh, it's uh, the correction done during the processing. So the data should be um, uh, compatible. The and it'll be optimized for the. Uh, uh, for the local uh, conditions, bringing um, the Northern Ireland and um, Scottish data together into a single uh, image, you would have to reproject uh, anyway. Um, are level three cloud free composite images available? Um, I think not at the moment is the answer. Uh, to that, that that was one of the requests for a WMS. Uh, yeah. uh, looking forwards, that a cloud-free mosaic um, was top of uh, most people's list as as a product um, to use, but that's not something that we have available at the moment. Um, but it is certainly uh, on uh, high on the wish list. I think would be fair to say. Um, Paula mentioned that the features now align in images captured in different dates. Does that mean previous issues with alignment of features have been sorted out? I think it was an issue with the data capture from ESA. Do we know anything more on the, uh, the image alignment? Uh, I, can, I can answer this as well. So um, there is a global issue with all satellite data, optical satellite data at the moment, um, it's not a common issue for Sentinel-2, Landsat has this issue as well, where in the higher latitudes the geometric accuracy isn't great um, and that's because we don't have, so the, the global di freely distributed digital elevation models cut out at a certain latitude so they don't cover the Shetland Islands for example in the UK, um, so that makes processing for geometric accuracy um, which is done before uh, it gets to level one process. So it's done before we get access to the data and can do anything about it at that stage. Um, but there is a, a global project looking at improving this, which um, they're trying to combat by creating a global Sentinel-2 cloud-free mosaic and creating um, ground control points from that global mosaic to then feed into the process to but it gets better geometric accuracy with the data. Um, and then that will be applied to all Sentinel-2 and Landsat data, I believe, moving forward. Um, since that is a solution that's been provided globally, we've kind of taken a step back from that and sort of let that happen. And when it happens, then the data where we'll be picking up that will happen to the data organically, so we won't have to worry about it. But that project uh, has had delays and I'm not sure what the current status it is, but it, it, it's not okay. progressing as we would like. Um, there are things that you can do to Im improve the geometric accuracy. Um, there's specific problems in Scotland, um, but uh, that's an extra processing step. And the more processing you do to the data, the more data you lose every time. So, um, it, you know, I think it would be application specific. And uh, if you really need that geometric accuracy, then there are things you can do post-process to the ARD data to improve that. Okay, okay. So thank I guess you. I'll just... come, come speak to us or we'll speak to the people that are experts in your organization and I can do that for you. Thank you. I'm just conscious of time. We've only got a few minutes left uh, and there are a couple more questions. Um, uh, will this continue after leaving the European Union? Uh, obviously, the transition period um, uh, ends on December the 31st uh, of this year. Um, the, uh, the data itself will still be uh, globally available. 
um, and uh, the current we currently um, have an arrangement uh, with DEF as part of the DEFRA group to obtain this uh, the data um, commercially. So I don't see why that won't continue. So I think the uh, um, the supply of data uh, is uh, reasonably assured. Um, I think what we may be losing is the opportunities to influence uh, further missions or further work of the European Space Agency. Uh, well, the European Commission, because the European Space Agency is contracted by the European Commission to deliver okay. the Copernicus programme. So that's a common uh, misnomer. Um, the, the Copernicus programme is an European Union programme and the funds come from the Commission. European Space Agency just deliver part of the programme on behalf of the Copernicus programme. So they, they, they run missions Sentinel-1 and 2. You met said does Sentinel-3, for example. So. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, and finally, um, uh, a question, uh, uh, a follow-up around the Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland. Um, is uh, uh, is the, uh, around the digital elevation model used for that, is the digital elevation model clipped at the border or what DM is being used for the Republic of Ireland? Um, so the, uh, uh, wow, is that, um, I think the, um, we have a, a, a digital elevation model that I think covers the area of the data that we have. Um, uh, the, I think we'll have to follow up on that one because I don't know whether that extends over the Republic as well. Yeah, we don't, we don't clip any of the data of the DEMs, we just throw it in. So, so, so obviously all of the individual image and images and granules are processed separately. Um, so we just throw uh, a DEM that covers all the areas. So uh, I think that question might be answered with, from Ian perhaps, what was the coverage of the DEM that you provided us with? Well, <laughs> do you know? It, yes, I do. It's, it, it is Northern Ireland specific. Um, there we go. From our ordnance survey. Uh, we were probably online here, so they'll be pleased to know that. Yeah. So we, if if that's only Northern Ireland, then we will have uh, uh, filled the gaps for the rest of the uh, Republic of Ireland, which we need for the data sets that cover Northern Ireland with the um, SRTM data set, which is 30 meter resolution and available uh, globally and for free, but not as good quality. <laughs> Excellent. Well. Um... Thank you very much that uh, we are now at uh, um, uh, the closing point for this webinar. I do hope you've found it uh, uh, a useful experience and we'll be um, investigating and making use of the data. And I'm certain that Shona and Ian will be very pleased to um, uh, hear about some use cases and um, a, a demand for this data going forwards. So I'd like to... Uh, um, Finally, thank all of the speakers today and uh, wish you stay safe and thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Yeah, um, thanks very much, everyone. And uh, people are using the questions uh, feature to uh, pass on some thanks to everyone. So thank you very much.